Welcome to the Driving Sales Defining Leadership Podcast. Today, we're going to follow up with a topic that we've had in the past couple of, of weeks around who should have scorecards. And we're going to do a scorecard episode, this one for managers. I'm Bart Wilson. I'm joined by Craig Wilson. What's up, Craig? What's going on? Craig's our resident scorecard expert, so he's got all the details. And we've got J.D. Mixon, per usual, on this. What's up, J.D.? What is up, Bart and Craig? Glad to be here. With I, you guys. I like the new mic. Your your tones are so they're 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 golden. They're sultry. They're you know, it's my radio DJ voice. So in the past podcast episodes, we've talked about manager scorecards and the fact that yes, we are on the side of the fence that managers need to be held accountable, just like frontline employees. And if you can align those quotas and metrics. It's going to mean you've got a more aligned department. Everybody's to use the old metaphor rowing in the same direction. So we're going to see how far we get here, how many of these we can get through today. Uh, but we're going to start with the sales department and the first job role we're going to go th through is what we're defining as a new car manager. Uh, someone who runs the sales floor, for lack of a better term. Uh, in my experience, the used car manager kind of sat over on the side and did the, the used car stuff and would desk a deal if they had to, right? But m predominantly, it was more about managing the inventory, not managing people. I don't know, you guys, what, is that your experience or did you have anything different on your side? Yeah, I agree that uh, we know every dealership is going to be different with roles and responsibilities. But that is certainly something that you see them typically in charge of. Maybe we should look at this less as a job title and more as a as a pers or persona or role and responsibility. So let's define this role right now. Uh, for this particular scorecard, it is someone who is accountable and responsible for selling cars and managing a sales staff. This is a person that is, you know, could be desking deals. Uh, they could be managing new car inventory. It's possible, but their most important role is to take turns with customers, sell vehicles and manage that sales staff. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I think that aligns with kind of what we've got on the, the sample uh, scorecard here. So, okay, well, hopefully that's a little bit, a little bit easier for us to quantify or talk about it. And then we'll, we'll go into the, the used car in a second. Before I jump into that, I just wanted to, man, maybe we talked about this on the last one, um, but I know when we when we did the frontline employees, like the service advisor and the salesperson and stuff, we kind of tried to stick to uh, a little bit more simplified and didn't go crazy with the number of quotas. Um, but when you're when you're looking at the manager job role, I think because their responsibilities are a lot more uh, broad than you know, your salesperson that it's okay to have more than, you know, four or five or six of those. Uh, so, you know, it, I, I just want to bring that up in case anybody listened to uh, our previous ones and thought, man, why do they have so many of these if we didn't, you know, on, on the other stuff. So. If we're talking about a new vehicle sales manager, uh, what is one of the first quotas, Craig, that, that you think that should be on a scorecard? The, the first one we have, I, I you, you touched on it, is is inventory related. I don't know how many uh, new car managers do inventory or if it's the GSM that does a lot of that stuff, but uh, and, and how you want to measure it, if it's the the new car turn or day supply or whatever, you guys would probably know a little bit better than I would on, on how that's measured. JD, what are your thoughts on 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 measuring or, or uh, scoring a this sales manager role against, against day supply on inventory. Ooh, so <laughs> broken record, every dealership's different, but there has certainly been, uh, it seems with, with managers that I've spoken with lately, uh, a little bit of a transition away from, and, and even uh, I was going to say a transition away from that Dale Pollock model of a, a hard, um, uh, a hard, uh, number on how long should we, we should be holding vehicles and in inventory, whether it's new or used. But um, I certainly think age is important. We have to be, we have to be 
looking at what our floor plan expense is and the age of those new units that are on the lot, that's the biggest impact, right? Like we want to sell them before it hits our floor plan. So I, I totally agree, Craig. That needs to be one of the first quotas that we're looking at on the on the new car side, regardless of how we're, um, you know, what our overall dealership, um, our, our objectives are for how quickly they need to sell. We need to be aware of it. I agree. Uh, I The closer you can tie a scorecard to a manager's pay plan, the more effective it's going to be. And, you know, you could say, you know, floor plan credit dollars or whatever you want to say mm -hmm. it as I think it's easier just to talk about your turn and it could be average day supply. Uh, you could go ahead and do some type of a new car turn, even if the new car managers and I've been in stores uh, organizations where I ordered the new cars and I was responsible for that as that job role. And I've been in stores where we had a, you know, an inventory manager that managed the new car ordering and I didn't have to do that. Either way, uh, I, I firmly believe that, that that new car manager should be held accountable for the, the inventory and, and the age. So you mentioned like aged inventory. Is that a, a different metric, like measuring what, how many cars or what percentage of your inventory is over a certain amount of days, or is that just all lumped into that same? It's, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a great question. It's another way to look at it. And some people might want to look at it like top box. Like I want to, I want to look at the percentage of my inventory outside of X amount of days. Some people just might want to just average it out and say my average new car day supply or my average new car unit on the ground is X. And some people might actually want to do turns if, if you can figure that out. But in my mind, how are they paid? How can you, how can you tie that into a, a, some of the accountability and, and how are you managing them? Yeah. It, this is really a, a scorecard um, basic or first step. We need to look at those pay plans when we're developing the scorecard and it might make us realize, Hey, we might need to tweak our, our pay plans here, but that's not necessarily a requirement. Uh, the one thing you don't want to do is have a pay plan that manages a, B and C and then your score ca scorecard only ma manages X, Y, and Z. There has to be some correlation if you want these to stick and really drive performance. That's that everybody rowing in the same direction metaphor right. again, right? Like the pay plan should row in the same direction as the, as the job role. Yeah, and I wonder if we would have been doing this uh, podcast, what, two, two or three years ago, if this would even be a thing we were talking about because that's not – something that was an issue back then is turning your inventories probably. So, um, so I, I think, again, we probably talked about this, but a lot of these quotas are probably quotas that were on the salesperson, but they're going to roll up. And instead of, you know, scoring them on an individual, you're, you're scoring them on a team, uh, based performance. So the first one is the, the front end gross. Um, I assume new car managers are the ones pricing vehicles. Um, so to me, that's a pretty big one. Yeah, that to me is a no brainer. They've got, they've got all the control in the world over, over that, of that gross profit and they should be held accountable. Now, whether again, you do gross dollars, which I don't know if I'd recommend, or you do per vehicle, you know, a PVR, uh, we should be managing them on that. Yeah, that's what we've got here is a PVR. So, you know, um, averaging it out. Um, this one, I, yeah, we have it on here. I don't know if it's if it's more on. The, I guess it depends on your dealership process. But what are, what are your thoughts on scoring them on back end PVR? I I'm a fan. I I really am. I feel like that the deals can be structured and for that. And the 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 other side of this is you know, who's accountable and responsible for training those those sales associates. The, the finance managers in most dealerships, they, they don't have that kind of, that kind of pull, uh, maybe on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but as far as like, here's how we pencil a deal, here's how you intro to finance. I, I feel like that I want to hold management accountable again, if it's part of their comp plan, they should, they should be held accountable for it. What are your thoughts, JD? 
that's you, you said it there at the end. If it's part of their comp plan, they need to be held accountable. Um, it is again the the ability that every dealership has to make a every role and position uh, responsible for whatever they want means we need to have some versatility in these in these scorecards. And I think that's one of the you know the the things that we always stress at driving sales is we have to approach these as a one-off. Every dealership is not identical. And so that quota specifically though, there's a high likelihood that it should be included. Um, especially when so many of them are already desking deals and, and we've got to be aware when we're desking that deal, we need to have in the back of our mind, what's going to happen when they step into finance, right? So we've got to set everyone up for success in the dealership and managing that quota or reviewing that quota is a great way to, to do that. I think another good way to look at this is as, as the scorecard is not the the end all objective here, the end all objective here is to have a, a really, really strong coaching session with that manager and plan and strategize on what they can do to get better and their team to get better. I want to be able to have that conversation with my manager about why our inventory is out of whack. I want to have that conversation with my, with my sales manager on, you know, why our PBR isn't where it should be because that accountability should be there. They are, they might not handle and manage all of the back end PBR, but they have a part in the process. And so they, I think they should be there for sure. Yeah. Um, great. So, so next up is every, probably everybody's favorite. I think it's been on every uh, scorecard that we've done so far. And that is CSI. In this case, we'd be talking about obviously your, your new car department, CSI. I'm unfamiliar. CSI. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> One of my absolute favorite, favorite metrics it blows me away that so many dealers hate how closely this is monitored but golly this is this is the number and and i know that we get upset like why didn't they give us all fives or whatever the whatever the scoring system is but uh managers if there's a number they should know off the top of their head based on how frequently their oem allows uh for that um that figure to for them to see that updated figure they should know it right and if you are um if you're not with an oam you know if uh you should still know your whatever your google score is right your google star rating like we all have a way to, to determine our csi so that yeah that that's probably the the easiest quota to know that every manager should have on their scorecard and think of the dialogue or the discussion that would happen with a manager if you're reviewing their NPS, their CSI, their whatever they call it, and it's not performing up to standard. There, there are really two, maybe two paths you can take. One is we need more reviews. We need, you know, uh, like, okay. The other path is what are we doing that we need to correct so that, that we can get that that metric higher? How can we learn from, from these? Yes. And so- yeah, agreed. Uh, definitely should be on there. Yeah, and I think my, you know, my comment about everybody's favorite, I, I think my, just in my experience with it is like the the fact that how, how they score it a lot of times and what you're allowed to explain to the customer and things like that, you know, like I had somebody come and install something in my house and at the end he, you know, he's like, hey, you're going to get a survey. I'd appreciate if you fill it out. You know, anything less than five is basically like a zero, you know, for him. And, and you know, when you explain it like that, the guy did an awesome job. Of course, I'm going to give him all fives. But if you weren't able to to bring that up, you know, it's who knows what I would have. I still would have given him all fives, but you never know with, with people. So, hey, look, I I envision an, an episode in the future where all we talk about is CSI and how to get five stars every time, like. That right. would be a great thing. And maybe I'm a little more right. jaded because I, well, I'm from the fix off side. And I, I think maybe customers inherently are not as happy when they're having to get their cars fixed as when they're buying new ones. So um, maybe that's not as big a deal on the, uh, yeah, the sure. sales side. Um, oh, it's, it's just as bad. And it, it's, you know, it, it gets to be where one simple misstep, usually toward the tail end, I'm not going to mention a department that rhymes with. <laughs> 
crying ants, but typically there may be something at the tail end of that process that could ruin everything or a poor delivery. And it's just the same problem on the sales side or the people that just, I'm preaching to the choir here, but the people that just never give anybody five stars, right? They're, they're out there and, and they're the worst. Yeah. <laughs> I always just tell myself, I like to think that those are the people that get their food spit in uh, restaurants because <laughs> they're like that everywhere. And that used to give me comfort <laughs> when they did a bad review. So um, so the next one, you could probably, I, I don't know if you got, how you guys want to break it up. Maybe it's a, you're measuring both um, or one or the other, what you guys would think. And instead of measuring like a, a set number of gross dollars or a set number of, of units sold, we're we're measuring what percentage of of your forecast for those did you hit so again i don't know if it's something you would measure both what percentage of your you know your vehicle sold forecast did you did you hit or achieve and then what percentage of your gross forecast did you achieve or if you would just measure one or the other i feel like that you would either measure your pvr or you would measure your total front end gross um, but I do like, and this is, we've said this before, some, some of these quotas, they're, they're better off because of the, of the, of the, uh, the fluctuation between, you know, or the seasonality that happens in the car business. If you, if you do a forecast, most of us do, um, whether it be annually or, or more and more or starting to do it quarterly, but, but this is just a percentage against forecast. That way you don't have to change the number every month. You're not hitting a moving target, you know? I need to do 110% of my forecast. It's it's that simple. And uh, it makes it a little easier to to manage and to 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 figure out. What are your thoughts, JD? Would you measure <clears throat> both your, you know, number or volume and gross or would you prefer one or the other? I would go with one or the other simp uh, simply because we don't want the scorecard to be another job. Uh so it should be as concise as possible. Um, so typically you can, you can give that manager direction by only using one of the two. Uh, cool. So, um, the next couple we have are, are kind of related to the fact that these managers are doing, uh, these reviews monthly with their salespeople. And so, um, the first one is, you know, what percentage of those reviews with your employees or salespeople were completed by the 10th of the month? Um, which I think the 10th is, is easily achievable. I would err on going a little bit, you know, earlier than that, because that gives you more time in the month to uh, make any, you know, corrections or, or talk about anything that they're going to change as opposed to, you know, waiting later in the month. But um, what are your guys' thoughts on that? If there was one, if there was one quota that should be on every manager scorecard, it's this: if they are accountable and responsible for a staff of people, a team, they should be scored on the percentage of reviews that they get done by a specific day. And I think we're doing the tenth because, you know, if we say for for all the sales reps or the BDC agents or the service advisors or whatever the role is. I need yours done by the fifth. This gives them a little bit of grace period, but I agree with you. It's almost like the month's third over. Like, like how much impact or change are we going to make in, in, in two thirds versus think about how, how much we could do if we had a, a few more days there. But yeah, this would be like the last absolute dead last um, score or, or date that they could get that done. Yeah. Yeah. It's if, as long as a manager is approaching these, uh, reviews with their team as, as what they should be. And it's a quick conversation. These aren't one hour meetings with each, each team member, right? This is a, this is just a, a quick check-in. It's a chat. It is engagement with your team. And that's what, that's all it needs to be. Don't make it more than it has to be. So you, if you approach it that way, you'll have them done long before the 10th. And, and in a perfect world, I, I also just want to underline, because we may have managers out there going, whoa, whoa, I've got 14 people on my team. The it, This needs to be structured to where you have five to seven reviews per manager to do. If you find that you've got a whole bunch of people that you have to do reviews for, you need to look at, do I have a senior sales consultant or BDC agent that wants to be in management that I can maybe 
delegate some of these to? Do I have another person on my team that can share the load? Because, because you should have, you should have a manageable amount of reviews that you have to do. And, and typically we find out that people that are doing a lot of reviews, they, they're trying to take on too much um, from a job role perspective, or they just haven't, they haven't structured it properly. And, and you don't want to, you don't want to own that. You want to share it. Uh, somewhere we often see that is when you have a centralized uh, manager that is doing everyone's reviews. Like you have, maybe it's your HR manager and they're the ones that are doing every review. Well, the problem there is they're not going to be able to ask the questions that are going to drive improved performance of your team. And the other thing is when we talk about engagement, engagement doesn't mean that they just go talk to anybody and they feel like they're heard. Engagement is them speaking to their, I hate this term, but their superior, you know, whoever their leader is, and they know that their ideas and their, their struggles are being heard. That's engagement, right? So I'm with you, Bart. One person can't do 15 reviews, but we have to make sure that it's also, we're not um, just tossing this responsibility off on someone else because we say we don't have the time. I worked in a store. The organizational structure was three sales managers, two team leaders, and two two different departments. So, uh, you know, an A and a B team. And these team leaders were over these teams, and each team had, I don't remember how many people on it, you know, seven to eight. If we're talking about superior, and I hate that word as well, but I would not make the a general sales manager, for example, do reviews for the sales staff. I would have the team leader do it. Yeah. The people that are rubbing shoulders with them every day, the people that can help to impact that. Just one step up on this organizational chart is all you need. And I think that's a great point that you're making about, well, we've got, you know, Susan and HR, she'll do it. Well, yeah, of course. And and guaranteed, you guys, every dealership's got one, a Susan and HR that will get it done. <laughs> but it's probably not the best conversation. I mean, think about it. How are they going to help that BDC agent improve their appointment set percentage? And and that there, there's probably a disconnect there. It should be their immediate supervisor that they can go to and that they're rubbing shoulders with all the time that should be doing the review. What's next on the list? We, we've, we've gotten through a lot of the, uh, what I would consider the inventory, maybe a lot of the sales numbers, at least performance-based quotas. We've gotten to some customer satisfaction. We've talked a little bit about, you know, scoring your team's average. What, what else do we have on a manager scorecard? Uh, so the next one we have actually goes along with the one we just talked about a little bit. And it is, what is your average, your salesperson average score on those reviews? So assuming you built a scorecard based on the model that we talked about and you're, you're scoring them on you know one to five or whatever, um, what's their average review score? So as a manager, you know, obviously you want to help your team achieve higher review scores, um, which in turn would help you on this, this quota here. So, And in turn would, would give your, your uh, leadership team a good um, litmus test, if you will, for how well your, your dealership's performing. You can game all of this. Anybody can game this. But if you are honest with yourself and you treat this the right way and you do these reviews with your staff and you get that average score, it's a great way to hold your yourself, your team, and your dealership accountable. Yeah, obviously, if I build a scorecard that everybody can easily get five stars, everyone's going to make me look like a rock star. But in the end, kind of defeats the purpose of the whole, the whole thing that we've been talking about here. So, uh, so the... This one is not on the one kind of the template we created, but it's, it's something that I've seen a lot of uh, dealerships do, and that's scoring their their people on percentage of their their OEM training. And, and maybe if, if this isn't a big deal in your dealership, you know everybody's always up to up to speed on that. Then you probably don't need to include it. But if you if you're one of those that struggles with getting your guys when new training comes out to complete it for your presidents or whatever, I think it's a good one to to measure. All right, so I'll, I'll say one thing with that. 
uh, that's a layup quota. That should be five stars every time. But I'm not saying that so you don't include it. We need to make sure that we do have some quotas in there that we know our team is going to hit, right? We, we need a couple layups for them. Uh, the whole scorecard can't be that way. But when you're having that one-on-one, -on -one, to be able to at least know the one thing, hey, great job. You got your, uh, your up-to-date on your OEM training. Like, to always have that go-to to start that conversation out can be nice. Yeah. Um, you know, a couple others we're, we're talking about rolling up from salespeople is, uh, you know, scoring them on things like overall closing percentage or, you know, appointment show percentage, things like that, that we're scoring the salespeople. What are your thoughts on scoring them on their department average of, of those items? I feel like that just like with the salesperson, Craig, uh, check and balance. If I'm going to have a closing percentage, I promise you, your salespeople hit that number. And, and it comes by who am I going to log and how am I going to, you know, they will work it. So that would have to be combined with another number that, that made that check and balance that they couldn't gain. I'm a big fan of, of appointment set appointment show numbers for managers like averages, because that gives them an idea of how well the team's performing. And do I need to do tr team training on, on some of these things instead of individual training? Great. But if you're going to do that, you need to score them on the total number of, of calls or, or the total number or something just so that they have that check and balance. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, um, <clears throat> again, if you're scoring the salespeople on it, uh, it's, it's important to whoever's in charge of training them and getting them. Let, let's just, let's just take a, put a pin in what you just said because, or, or expand on what you just said. I can make a case for taking a, a frontline employee scorecard copying and pasting it to a manager's and, and replace every individual thing with team. I mean, I'm not saying that you want to do that. There might be some that you can, you, you know, you can, you can drop off the list, but if you think about it, that alignment needs to be there. And if I get done with a manager scorecard and I don't see that, that those metrics have, have, have rolled up, I probably want to re redo it and add some of those so that everybody's accountable for and rowing in the same direction. Um, yeah, I agree. I, I think the last one that I, that I can think of or that we're, we're looking at here, and this might be dependent on your, uh, your OEM, but I think a lot of, of new vehicles are coming with, we you know these connected services and stuff like that. So a lot of them are being scored on, you know, what percentage of those they're, they're taking care of at the delivery and things like that, that is, is heavily impacting a, a, their overall presence award or whatever they call it. Uh, that is going to be a, a, a very important quota, but it is already being measured elsewhere. So it dependent upon your OEM, it may be good to have on there, but at the same time, if it's already being managed elsewhere, perhaps you don't need to have that on your scorecard. Right, let's let's concentrate on those items that are going to improve that individual and you know hopefully also improve sales. So uh, it could be important, Craig, but not everywhere. Th th this is probably a good point to 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 mention that you don't want quotas changing month to month. But if you as a leadership yes. team of, an or of your dealership are struggling in a specific area put it on the scorecard. And so if your dealership ha is having issues with your, your Hyundai's getting the connected services enrolled at time of, of delivery or whatever that is, put it on there, you know, in a case by case basis. Something that I had a dealer doing uh, Bart, and this was on the, uh, it was on the service side, but whatever service sales doesn't matter. Um, they wanted to keep a, um, an eye on comebacks. And rather than adjusting their scorecards, they were just having their team keep track of it on their daily checkout. And so they were putting that comment in there on their daily checkout if they had to come back that day. And that's kind of how they were doing that instead of adjusting the scorecard. So there's different ways you can, you can measure it. But yeah, if it's important, if it's something you're battling with, you got to stay on top of it and have it there visually. 
this makes so much sense because you can't pay an employee on everything. A lot of times we'll, we'll throw spips at, at things because we want to improve them. That's fine. But you can't pay your employee on everything. You put it on the scorecard and attach their average score to some comp, or even if you just have it on the scorecard and, and they're looking at it and they're, they're monitoring it and they're measuring it monthly, you'll see an improvement. So, so you've rolled, you've given us, how many original ones have you given us then? I think we probably talked about eight or nine. So. So if you take a look at those eight or nine quotas that we just reviewed and, and you add a few more off of that salesperson scorecard, you can see, as JD mentioned earlier, that, that you're going to have more than five or seven quotas and that's fine. You know, they're over more people. They've got a, they've got a bigger view of the world. So you, know, you might end up with 12, maybe 14. That's okay. But that should give you a decent scorecard. You, you're once again, you've talked about your inventory, talked about your, your gross. You, you've got into some sales performance, you talked about customer satisfaction. Uh, it, it's a pretty well-rounded scorecard. Anything that you would add to that from like a new car manager standpoint, either one of you? Yeah, I, I think that you made a great comment a, minute, a moment ago when you said if there's anything that the dealership or the department is struggling with, I know I'm not giving you an example, but that is uh, that is going to be key to allowing these scorecards to help drive improvement um, at your store. So just concentrate on that. If, if there's something that you know we need to work on, that's what you need to, you need to make sure that that's being measured on your scorecard. Well, we've got a few more minutes then. Um, couldn't agree more. Let's just talk about maybe some of the differences between this new car job role, this persona that we just talked about and a used car manager. What are some of the things that a used car manager should have on there? And if, if it was my store, I would say, here's my new car scorecard. Here's my used car scorecard. For every used car quota I'm putting on here, I'm going to take off a new car one. I don't want them to have 65 more, more quotas, but depending on what their job role is, that shouldn't be too difficult. So what are some of the things we'd want our used car manager scoring on? Yeah, I think you're swapping new car turn for used car turn. Um, <clears throat> you know, that's a pretty obvious one. And then I, I've been trying to think as we're talking the only other difference you might have is, you know, if they're over getting trade-ins or, you know, stocking the the used car lot as opposed to just going to the auction but getting trades, how that's how that's done. And then um like recon time or if that's more on the service side or what. But so I'm glad you said that because that's what I was thinking about was recon time. And while the used car manager is not directly responsible for how long it's going to take to get that vehicle um, reconditioned. Some of that mutual responsibility can be very beneficial, right? As long as it's handled correctly. Let's be honest. If the used car manager isn't responsible for that, who is? I mean, somebody's got to own it. And then, you know, everybody's going to turn and look at the used car manager when that question comes up. Yes. Yes. So they need to be aware of that number, you know, what that average recon time is. And you don't have to have some fancy piece of software. Uh, you can manage this from a spreadsheet, but you better have it somewhere, right? So you can quickly know how long uh, vehicles um, are taking to recondition. Cause that's money. That is money. Cause that, that is hitting your floor plan the moment you take it in. When, when you come time, when you're thinking about trade-ins, what are your thoughts on a, look to book percentage. If it's too high, maybe you're, you know, you're putting too much money in cars. If it's too low, you're not putting enough money in cars. So there's this sweet spot. What are your thoughts about having some type of a look to book number or what do you put in on that scorecard for a trade in metric? Cause I think it's extremely important. And that's, Golly, that's a tough one. Uh, it's that is certainly one of those quotas that is going to fluctuate quite a bit with the market, and we need to be cognizant of that, you know, as uh, um, as the dealer. But yeah, I do believe it's important to uh, to keep an eye on um, how if that should 
there's a low likelihood that that's going to be directly in the pay plan. It's certainly possible, but um, you just, I, I think you just have to be careful with some of those uh, because of those market fluctuations, right? Like if I can pay more money on the front end, if I know I'm making it all back on the other vehicle, on the uh, vehicle I'm selling to them. So. Yeah. But if I'm checking and balancing that used car manager and I'm scoring mm -hmm. them against used car gross, if they're putting too much in the vehicle, to get that look to book percentage up, it should impact our, our, our front end yeah. gross on used cars. So there may be a way to, to, to do that, but I definitely, I definitely like the thought of putting something in there to kind of measure and track the performance of your trade in process. It's important. It's a big deal. It's important. Yeah. Um, one that I think could also be beneficial is the average age at sale for vehicles. Uh, Bart, you mentioned spiffs a little while ago. How many times have we seen, we know when, when a vehicle typically is like dependent upon the store, if it's at 60 days or if it's at 90 days on a, on the used side, all of a sudden that manager is putting an extra, you know, maybe it's a hundred bucks, maybe it's two fifty, maybe it's 500 bucks for a spiff. How many times have you seen salespeople on day 89, not go show that vehicle because they know what happens at day 90? So these are some of those little things that we need to keep in mind. And if we can keep track of how many vehicles sold between day 90 and maybe day 95, it might start to paint a picture that you didn't want to, that you didn't necessarily want on your wall. Right. But, uh, I I'm a fan of keeping track of the average age at sale. Yeah. So, so, and I'm not saying that we need two, but we could track, you know, uh, percentage of units under you know over 60 days under inventory yeah. we could look at your turns we could look at average age at sale find a, find whatever metric and maybe it's two but find whatever quota that you want to put in there to make sure you manage that the, the only other one i've got is what about i think it, stores that are running really well are buying a lot of cars off the street mm -hmm. it's a great way to get inventory is this something that a used car manager should be, you know, held accountable to, or, or how, how would you see that? Well, the other, the other side of that is buying off the street or buying in the drive, you know, buying them out of service as well. So it's kind of the same thing there. Uh, I think that the most successful, I should say what I've seen is the most successful used car stores have a, a high percentage of vehicles they are buying off the street or out of service. So it's certainly worth tracking in some way or another. Um, the scorecard may be difficult um, if you're if it's something you're just now starting. But what you could always do is you could set your goal low, you know, set that scorecard quota low, and just know that it needs to increase. But we should be buying that way, whether it's service or street. Every vehicle we're taking in on the used car side cannot be from the auction, and it cannot be from trade-ins. So it needs to be tracked somewhere. I think we'll leave that up to the dealership and what their structure is. Some people have a job role that's, that's what they do. Yeah. You know, they're, it's a, it's this hybrid sales and service role. Some people, you know, are going to look at their used car manager and, and go with that. Some people are going to, you know, we don't have a buying team. It's our salespeople. We want them out there looking for cars. So, but I definitely see an opportunity to, to score somebody uh, on that role. So I think, uh, you know, I could talk about this all day long, but I don't think that people want us to. Uh, we've, we've covered sales manager and what we call new car manager and used car manager. I think you can get an idea that, that once you get that basic new vehicle manager, uh, however you want to say, that sales manager job role built, that the framework there, the bones, it's easy to say, well, let's throw these two on for this role, those two on for that role and, and as different types of managers. If you've got a sales manager and I don't know, a desking manager or a closer or whatever, it's easy to kind of modify those, but this should give you a, a good start. Do you, do you have anything to add more on, on these, these, these sales manager positions? I think we've given a lot of great ideas. And we're obviously open. If anybody has any questions, just reach out to us podcast at driving sales.com. And we'll, you know, jump on the phone with you or jump on a, jump on a little uh, screen share to review it. Do it. Yeah. I would love the challenge. Love to hear about this because once, once again, this is a basic job role 
uh, that not everybody's going to have in their stores. Everybody's yeah. set, set up differently. So please, let, you know, let us know. Just email us at podcast at drivingsales.com. We'd love to hear your, your thoughts and feedback there. In addition, JD, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, the VIP uh, program we have? Yes. Yeah. So at driving sales, it's important to us that the conversation is led by what you, our community needs. So um, you need to sign up to be a driving sales VIP. Uh, it's as easy as um, just email VIP at driving sales.com, or you can email podcast at driving sales.com uh, or just come to the community, check out this, um, the community post about this uh, uh, podcast episode right here. And there will be a link on there as well, as, as well as some more information about these different quotas that we're talking about. So you definitely want to reach out, help us decide and determine what we're going to, uh, what topics we're going to cover next, um, what trainings we're going to have on our webinars, um, everything. It is driven by our community and uh, strongly driven by our VIPs in that we know those are the folks that are paying attention to the industry. So yeah, per appreciate that. And at the end of the day, once again, if you go to drivingsales.com, click on the community tab and the, and the navigation bar at the top, that will get you to where all these discussions are happening. And we'd love to hear your feedback and thoughts. This is this is what makes this industry great is we can share things like that. But Craig, JD, thank you so much for, for spending a few minutes talking about manager scorecards and kind of fleshing that out. Of course. And I, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, also tell everybody, make sure you give us that five-star review because anything less than five, when you rate us on your uh, favorite podcast app, you might as well give us a zero. Did I do it I right, Craig? It. Did I do it right? Yeah. I love it. Well, thank you. Uh, and once again, thank you very much, everyone for joining us. And we hope to see you on the next Driving Sales Defining Leadership podcast. Mm -hmm.